welcome to the second in our series of videos where we uh, dig a little bit deeper into the subject of our Sunday sermon. So uh, the Sunday just gone was the first Sunday after Trinity um, and Philip uh, took us into a picture uh, which um, has become known as the Hundred Guilders. Hundred Guilders. Printing etching. Yeah. I thought maybe first of all, um, Philip, you might start by doing a bit of technical stuff for us and explain to people watching who might not be familiar with the medium yes. what, what an etching is, because to the naked eye and to the untrained eye you would say it looks a bit like a, um, a pencil sketch, um, but it's not. It's something a bit different from that, isn't it? Well, it's a, a way of propagating your work. Uh, before there was uh, printing properly with photographs. No photographs, no printing. But there was, because they used copper or zinc plates and the artist would draw with an incised pen, make scratchings, uh, as it were, and then um, would cover the uh, surface with ink and water repellent substance, but the ink would fall into the into the groove mm -hmm. uh, and so you would then ink up with a roller and then you would take a print um, having wiped it take a print and the print in a press would catch the ink which has gone into the yeah. grooves which is the drawing and then you look at it and think well I want to change that or more hatching or scratching and mm -hmm. so on and then the, the work would develop so you'd have a, lot, a series of uh, one-offs the first indication of where you're going and then so on just like a, a real drawing but yeah. spaced out um, mm -hmm. and the artist would choose which was the best print um, and hopefully he would stop before he ruins it <laughs> <laughs> so kind of iterative process yeah. um, of refining and refining but it's very much uh, a, a, a drawing exercise yeah. um, and like drawing and painting you need two people the artist and somebody to say stop <laughs> because if you go on fiddling with it you just ruin it so yes because it's destructive it happens, isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. so there's Can't a moment when, it, when you're you're there and uh you need to stop and what's the story behind um, the name for this this print the hundred guilders print well i think that the, the story arose about 50 years after um rembrandt's death rembrandt was very successful as a young man it's extraordinary uh, as famous as Rubens. Rubens was mega, a, big, a mega star in Europe and uh, equivalent of a billionaire. And remember, always wants to be uh, like that. <laughs> so he used to uh, emulate uh, some of uh, Rubens' tricks. Uh, but he, um, he discovered um, a way of painting which dramatised the painting from a, 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 a lit point. So it kind of skewers the technique and Caravaggio developed this technique about 50 years before in Italy uh, and Rembrandt, Rembrandt never left Holland but a lot of other artists did mm. and went to Italy and perfected the style and came back and they were called the, the, the Caravaggiists we'd say and so he uh, was inspired by that and perfected it mm. and made it even more naturalistic than Caravaggio had. But, um, so the Hundred Guilders is presumably uh, uh, about how much was paid well, for a print? Or? Uh, no, no. Um, he, he was so successful, he was, he was matching Rubens, and mm. then suddenly everything collapsed because he couldn't pay his mortgage. He okay. overstretched himself, and one thing led to another, and his wife died, and uh, he was in a relationship with his housekeeper and another woman, and so on, and they were making claims uh, about him. So he um, settled what uh, property he had on his son, who was only 14, having mm. sold the house, it was too expensive, and was um, taken to court uh, and uh, sued for everything that he possessed. Oh, wow. Unfortunately, um, the son, Tobias, had uh, enough to, to help him set up a painting. He, he was allowed to keep his, mater his materials, his tools, mm. But when he was able to buy some of his work back, because it's a tremendous collection of his own work, of course, and other people like Rubens and even um, some uh, Italian painters, he, the one thing he is reported to have wanted most was this etching. 
mm. and he paid 100 guilders for it, which is quite a lot of money in today's value. Yeah, several th uh, tens of thousands maybe. Uh, and um, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's a nice story. He mm -hmm. certainly excelled himself in this print, and I think it's probably his finest work, mm -hmm. certainly his finest drawing, mm -hmm. the most interesting. So let's now um, mm -hmm. have a look um, at the image. Um, and there, if you go on the internet and search, you'll find lots of different um, images, which are made presumably from different prints, mm -hmm. um, so the, they, they're, they're all slightly different. Um, they're all um, slightly different in contrast and, and what's you know, shown in, in what the resolution. So do have a look um, and see what you can find because there is quite a lot of detail out there. But the print we've got on screen um, is quite a detailed one um, from an American gallery. Um, and um, what can we see looking at that picture? It's obviously it's a very busy image, isn't it? There's lots going on. Mm. Yeah. Uh, well, the centerpiece is Jesus slightly off centre. He's against a very dark background, and uh, uh, he looks to be outside the city wall. Uh, and it looks to be in a, a sort of well into the night because you can't see much at all. You can see a gateway with a, what appears to be a camel coming through, and out also coming streaming through that gate out of the city, as it were, are a lot of poor, handicapped challenged people uh, and they are looking all of them mostly looking at Jesus to help them. and of course the passage in, in as it's told in, in Matthew's account uh, begins by saying that the poor and the lame and others came to see Jesus uh, as often happens in, in the story mm -hmm. <coughs> but to, so that's on the right hand side of the picture uh, in, in the rather dark corner, these people emerging out of darkness, coming to the light of, of Jesus, which is emanating from him, <coughs> as, as it were. But there's even a, a brighter corner, which is the left-hand corner, where there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of people with funny hats, and obviously for themselves. It's the scribes and the Pharisees, doctors of the law, who are constantly baiting Jesus and asking him awkward questions, trying to trick him. And they've asked him a, a question about um, divorce. Uh, uh, we won't go into that, but that's the issue that's taking place there. <clears throat> and of course, they're so interested in their own affairs and their own opinions that they don't even hardly ever look at Jesus, mm. who is addressing <coughs> a young woman with a baby who's holding this completely uh, supine child fast asleep and offering the child uh, to Jesus. And he stretches out his right hand mm -hmm. to, to accept uh, the child, to, to bless the child as in the text. And you see somebody standing next to him who looks as though he's going to have his face slapped by the back of the hand. <laughs> it's Peter, who represents the disciples, who have been telling in, 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 in the story, telling the women to clear off, not to bother Jesus, because he's far too important. This seems to be a kind of obsession with the disciples. They're concerned about their status mm -hmm. and how they're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven or God, as it's described in both in Mark and, and Matthew, uh, and their status all the time. And Jesus is constantly telling them off. In fact, in the previous chapter, he says, unless you become, and they're arguing about who's going to have the best seats in the kingdom, he's just telling them that the kingdom won't be inaugurated any other way except through his suffering and death and resurrection. But they're deaf to that. They just want the, <laughs> the power grab. So he says, he brings a child, holds this child in his arms, blesses the child and says, unless you become like this child, or childish like you are, but childlike, then there won't even be a kingdom. But he does this three times. It's, it's more uh, apparent in Mark's Gospel than any of the others like a, a bell tolling mm. through, which is the warning of his destiny, which is going to be immense suffering uh, and sacrifice, death and resurrection. And on, on that theme of children, um, to the left mm. of the, the infant in arms, you've got another child, haven't you, who yes. seems to be dragging uh, his mother yeah, yeah. Um, and fighting through the crowds to get towards That's Jesus. Right. He, uh, child, the child is full of enthusiasm, as children are, um, the, nothing uh, 
deters them. But the mother's slightly hesitant. She's, she's looking into space and almost looking at Jesus, but not quite. As though Peter's rebuff has gone home to her and she's, she's frightened, like most mm. people are. Like coming to church, for instance, you know, for the first time. They don't yeah. really want to go there. And there's that hesitancy there. But the child is like, come on, pulling the mother. And there's a dog there also uh, encouraging. <laughs> Uh, this wonderful enthusiasm that dogs and children have and the natural uh, ability to recognise something which is good and wholesome mm. uh, and that's another thing that's been going on in, in, in Mark and Matthew's Gospel at this point the crowd are all saying what is this, this is a new teaching we've never had anything like this. this this man's got an authority not like the scribes not you know, based on uh, of their uh, pedigree of certification as it were mm. he just has this natural God given authority we like him it's different he's speaking to us ordinary people that crowd of people streaming out of the city to come to him for help guidance to hear his teaching we get a lot of this in Mark's gospel they mm. come to hear we're not told what the teaching is by the way <laughs> but we they come to hear it uh, and, uh, and it's such an interesting counterpoint in the composition of the yeah. picture isn't it on on the one side you have all these people who are eager to hear, eager to receive, um, and eager to be healed in many mm. cases. Mm. And then on the other side of the picture, you have all these people who, some of whom aren't even looking, um, some of whom have their ears covered by fancy hats. Yeah. You know, so there's the sense in which they're all bathed in the light of Christ, yeah. but they can't even see yeah. or hear what he's saying. And there's one enormous chap, looks like the back of Boris Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With his back to us, with the fanciest of hats, not fuzzy hair, but the fanciest of hats, not looking anywhere yeah. except over there, away from Jesus. Yeah. And uh, so Rembrandt, for me, has captured all the major theological themes in this story absolutely beautifully. Mm. Uh, and you can spend hours looking at it. And then I suppose we come to um, almost the, the second key character in the image. You, you've got Jesus, obviously, is the central focus and, mm. and all the lines in the picture draw to him or beam from him mm. um, but then um, as you follow this diagonal line down to the left from Jesus gaze mm. you find this curious character who looks different from everybody else by his dress mm. his hair and most importantly his expression and what he's doing with his hands who's this yes. chap he, he's lost in despair uh, and the text says uh, and he, 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 he went away sorrowing because he had great wealth what it is referring to is that in this chapter a young man uh, we're, not, we're not told he's a young man in Mark who's the first one to, to uh, evangelist to tell the story but Matthew uh, and Luke assume he's a young man rightly so because he ran now I've taken over a dozen pilgrimages to Jerusalem and the Holy Land and I went running through Nazareth once to find half of my party who got, got lost got lost <laughs> and we need to get them to the bus and all the Arabs shouted stop <laughs> no father stop you must not run you are a person in I don't know, authority I suppose <laughs> uh, and you're not supposed to do that it's an offence. <laughs> and of course, um, there is a remarkable story in Luke called the prodigal son when the father runs to meet the prodigal coming home. And that's, that's amazing. It's an extraordinary thing to do. Yeah. Uh, except that he had to. So th it's significant. Uh, this man ran and knelt down to Jesus and, and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit life? And Jesus says to him, when you know the answer, keep the law, keep the commandments. Um, and then he recites some. And the young chap, we we'll call him, you don't know his name, says, I've done this from my youth up. What else must I do? And Jesus, especially in Mark's account, looks at him. Jesus only looks a, people, uh, a few people in the Gospels and it's usually significant I think the other one that's really upsetting is when Jesus turned and looked at Peter who's just denied him mm. three times and is about to walk 
into uh, to be condemned to death and he looks at him and loved him Jesus only loves the beloved disciple in John's gospel we don't know his name we think it's John and Lazarus people say uh, in John 11 when he's come to the family of Lazarus the two sisters Mary and Martha to comfort them because Lazarus had died and he weeps and the people say look how he loved him so mm. you see how the intensity of that, that moment he looked at him and he loved him and he said you lack just one thing give all your goods to the poor and come and follow me and when you realise that Mark's gospel especially and the others follow it's all about following Jesus discipleship he's been offered a place in that train of people who will follow and he can't do it it's too much and he walks away sorrowing and Rembrandt captures the moment where he is full of sorrow and then in the text the disciples say well why couldn't he uh, follow why couldn't he give up his riches why should, why should he why should riches stop him from following and Jesus says it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is for a camel the biggest animal known to them to pass through the eye of a needle the smallest aperture they knew of course the camel coming through the gate is only a reference to that yeah. they actually meant it's impossible for the rich to enter and they this disciple said well there's no hope for any of us and he said, Jesus says something like, well, it's not possible for you, but everything is possible with God. Mm. And we found this, did we not, <coughs> last week, when um, Sarah laughed at the thought of her approaching a hundred, conceiving a child, mm. and Abraham had done the same. And they've been questioned about that. Is this not possible for God? So it's the same challenge and this has always intrigued me that this young man may have been another young man who suddenly appears in Mark's Gospel in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus has been struggling praying uh, that the cup might pass for him but we would do whatever God wants him to do which meant dying on the cross and he is led away captive by the guards who come to take him in the garden and the disciples who promised they would never leave him all flee, <laughs> all of them and there's one young man not, we're not told whether he's a disciple or not in Mark's gospel the twelve are disciples but there are many many more mm. he's a follower and he is there and he does follow Jesus he's the only one but the soldiers see him turn around and make a lunge at him and pull off his, his, what is in the Greek, a syndome, which is a kind of linen cloth, and he runs away naked. Now that's odd. Mm. The, other the other evangelists, when they're writing up this story, leave that out. They don't understand it. But it must have meant something to Mark's church or community he was writing to. And I think it means something as well, because um, in Mark's Gospel, I don't really discuss this at all, but it ends, the, the actual gospel ends at uh, 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 chapter 16, verse 8, in mid sentence. Some people mm -hmm. thought Mark had been dragged off to martyrdom, but he could, never finished it. He did. He knew what he was doing. What happens is that women come to the tomb, they're the only people who are brave enough. The disciples don't come to the tomb after the, uh, after the crucifixion. The women come with their spices and they wonder how they're going to roll the stone. They find the stone rolled away, they look in, and there is a young man, not an angel, a neoniascos in Greek, the same word used of that man in the garden, not used in, I wish it was, it make life was easy <laughs> in this story, but he, he, a young, obviously a, a young man, and he's clothed in a similar garment, and Jesus himself in Mark, we're told, at the, uh, uh, at the burial, is wrapped by a rich man 
Joseph of Arimathea in this Sindone garment, which were used in the very, very early church at adult baptisms. Mm. They were given a Sindone, a linen garment, to come out of the water and begin their new life. So Mark, for me, is suggesting that this young man actually did follow at a distance covertly and stuck with Jesus when the others ran away mm. but had to run away himself but somehow or other was the first witness of the resurrection and sat in this, possibly sat in the tomb to help to tell the women that it is possible and he says to the women who come you, he's not here. He's gone ahead of you. As he said, he will meet you in Galilee. Go and tell his disciples. But we're told by Mark, they were too frightened. They ran away. Mm. And he's such a significant character, I think, for us. Yeah. Um, because um, <clears throat> we, generally speaking, and I know I don't speak for every single person watching, but we in um, the 21st century West live a life of opulence, mm. you know, by comparison to the poorest in the world. <coughs> um, and that's uncomfortable. That's something we don't like to hear because, you know, we talk about cost of living crisis, mm. which of course has huge effects. And there are some people at the very bottom end of our economy who are really, really struggling. But for many of us, even struggling through the cost of living crisis isn't the same as living in war-torn Sudan um, or the battlefields of Ukraine. Um, w we don't really have a, uh, a sense of how wealthy we are, not just financially, but in the richness of our surroundings and, and the places we live. Um, and so this young man, for me, um, I kind of like your theory of him kind of recapitulating through, mm. through, the, um, through the gospel. Even if it's not the same young man, it's the same type, isn't yeah. it? It's the same um, character, in a sense, that stands in for us, mm. in a way. You know, how easy is it for us to inherit the kingdom? Mm. Well, we can follow all the commandments and live a good life and do all those good things, but actually, the thing that's stopping us is our wealth, our trappings, our belongings, and the things that consume our imaginations. And also, going back to the earlier discussion, um, the fact that we refuse to be childlike. Yes. in our approach to God the simplicity of the gospel is this that to be a follower of Jesus you become like him mm. and you've really got to look at his lifestyle to see the simplicity of it the clearness of the message and the total trust in God that he displays he, mm. uh, another um, famous character in history St Francis so emulated uh, Jesus that the first biographers called his biogra the, the biography of him his life the mirror of perfection because he was set like and Jesus and of course um, the very early years between the resurrection date and the first gospel which is about AD 17 about 25 30 years the church exploded mm. it was everywhere all right across the Mediterranean even by the time of Paul they're in Rome. Yeah. It's astonishing. This is 25 years after the crucifixion. And at a time when travel wasn't easy. <laughs> yeah, there was no internet and all the rest yeah. of it. And they knew the story. And they were, mm. the reason was because there was no distinction between rich and poor, Jew or Greek, male or female. They were all one in Christ. They met mm. together for the first time, different classes, different backgrounds, different, different ethnic groups as one and became literally the body of Christ on earth mm -hmm. and so it just caught everybody's a lot of people's imagination and broke down immense barriers and people sharing and giving to the cause as it were in a, in a way that yeah. it doesn't happen anymore um, and at, at the crux of this <coughs> kind of dynamic mm. shift is this this young man isn't mm. you know who who represents mm. us and where we are, but who represents all of us who come to mm. Christian faith, because they, I think for all of us, there comes a point, no matter if you're baptised or confirmed or neither, or, you know, whatever your relationship to, to your Christian faith, at some point, 
there's that um, it's like hitting a brick wall mm. and you go oh that's me mm. and it doesn't just happen with the rich young man it happens mm. with other characters mm. in, the, in the gospels too but I think particularly this, this young man um, brings us up short and makes us think okay am I am I really ready to do that mm. um, and for some people that will be the point at which they turn away and say well mm. actually I quite like the trappings of, of my modern life with my big TV and my multiple cars and you know posh house and swimming pool or whatever else the luxuries are that they might have quite like that not willing to give it up um, but I think that young man and the way that Rembrandt renders him um, he represents that angst yeah. you know because it's real it's not just <coughs> a case of oh Christianity's a lifestyle choice that I can pick yeah. or choose he's at the stage where he's already been bitten by the bug he's convinced of who Jesus is mm. and the reality has just dawned yes and he's, he's so thoughtful and mm. so sad at the same time you think this isn't the end of the story there's yeah. more to come there's got to be yeah mm. uh, there's every hope um, and of course next week we're going to look at uh, Matthew and I think we'll see a similar theme arise uh, which should be interesting um, but I do commend the, the prince if you have a look at it and even more read the story we were looking at in yeah. chapter 10 of Mark is the easiest one to read and if you can bear to start a little bit earlier at 9 and go on to 11 it'll make even more sense or sit down and read the whole gospel you can do it in two and a half it's quite short it's quite economical <laughs> two and a half hours yeah. and you'll, it'll change your life I tell you yeah. read it not as a holy book but something a, a, a new novel hot from the press mm. it's actually one of the most powerful things we were asked to do at college was yeah. to sit down mm. and read yes. the gospel in one sitting yeah. Um, it just transforms it because all those fragmented bits that you get on a Sunday suddenly lock together in a narrative form and you think ah that's why that happens there and not there uh, there is a theory and a, a, a friend of mine who used to teach English at UEA is developing it that the earliest telling of these stories were enacted dramatised yeah. and if you go to uh, campfires you, people do almost turn it to if you, a real storyteller will tell a story by acting it out mm -hmm. And I think there's every uh, likelihood that this is how it happens. Certainly, if you can read it aloud, or get somebody with a dramatic voice to read it aloud for you, or get this, uh, there's a um, oh, it's certainly kind of web, isn't there? But yeah, David Suchet. David Suchet, yes. Yeah. yeah. Hear somebody like that read it to you, you, it'll make a big difference. That's a really good point, actually. So if you want to have a dip into this story, um, but... Um, for whatever reason don't fancy reading it and sitting down that way um, you can um, find David Suchet reading the entire Bible to, the, to one particular version um, and it's spellbinding it's like listening to an audiobook of Harry Potter because uh, he, he's got the voice yeah. um, and he's really spent a lot of time studying and thinking about how to deliver it as an actor mm -hmm. so I commend that to you you do go and have a look um, I think you can do it as a podcast or there's an app so go and have a look online see if you can find it mm -hmm. So thank you, Philip. Um, another intriguing week with another intriguing image. Next week, we move on to Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. Different picture altogether. Um, do join us for the service on Sunday, if you can, either in person at half past ten uh, in Corston, or you can join us online at the same time on YouTube, or catch up afterwards. Either way is fine. Um, we hope you're enjoying these videos. If you are, please do leave a comment below uh, to let us know what you think, and if, you, if there's other things you'd like us to explore and discuss. Um, also, don't forget to like the video and click the subscribe button so you'll be kept up to date with what comes up next on our feed. So, hope to see you all again soon, and it's bye for now from me and Philip. Bye.